Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. Andy, how are you, my good friend? Very good, thank you. Very good, yeah, yeah. We are, what are we now? It's the beginning, oh my God, it's the beginning of December. Crikey. In fact, I know that because we just gave out um, all of our competition stuff yesterday. Beginning of December, wow, that has gone really, really fast. We're now racing into the Fire and Excellence Emergency Awards, or the Fire and Emergency Awards, sorry, in excellence, 2022. Feels like three months, probably, since, uh, since we were there a year ago with Sabrina and yourself and the team. How have you been? Yeah, great. It feels like a never-ending conveyor belt of handshakes and smiles and photos <laughs> and all the rest of it and hand, <laughs> handing out awards to happy recipients. But that's what life should be about. Is the um, there's, there's a whole new bunch of awards this year, isn't there? Because I, I, I don't know, because some of the obvious ones are the similar, similar categories it's... to what we were looking at last year. But are there, are there a couple I of think you just year? weren't paying attention last time, Pete. I th- they're pretty much the same. It's probably just others have grabbed your attention. I think that's probably um, what it is. I, I think, the, yeah, and it might be age, but we should yes, be age. Yes, most definitely. <laughs> um, I think the entries, I, I would say keep getting better. I, I think that's unfair on past winners. Um, I think they just the, the high standard um, keeps on going, and maybe we're just widening the gate and getting more entries from more diverse fields, which is which is great. I think there's probably a little bit of that in there, yeah. And, yeah, I think it's a combination because – you know, let's let's deal with the the issue. Should should you have awards in difficult times? I think they're more essential than ever that you're recognising the work of staff under incredible uh, pressure and conditions uh, that we that we're living through at the moment with wars and cost of living crisis and austerity and threat of industrial action. You know, the list goes on. Uh, mm-hmm. But actually, people that are doing remarkable things under duress should be recognised. And by and large, they're unsung. I mean, most of the people that we feature aren't recognised um, more broadly in the UK Fire and Rescue Service. We have a few celebs there, um, as, as you must, um, for the glitterati sort of aspect. <laughs> but the, it's, the, it's really the, it's the unsung heroes. We've, we've got a dog this time, for goodness sake. It's about time long overdue. We've got Rex, the fire investigation dog. Uh, from Hertfordshire. So um, it's it's been long overdue that dogs are, are given equal recognition to the rest of us. You've gone silent, Pete. What's happened? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just looking at the awards as you're speaking through there because I had seen Rex, but is it spelled R-E-Q-S? Is that why? Or yes. am I about, oh, I was going to yes. say, am I about to highlight to you a it's, spelling error that you've put on your award sheet? No, no, no. No, no, please don't. Um, the unsung, <laughs> yes, the uns- is, is going in, he, I think is he, is going in the Unsung Hero Award category. I, I question that because I think dogs are very much the heroes of the, you know, you'll see them at the awards, it'll be pandered forever. I think they get... I was going to say, I'm not sure they're unsung. They get more attention than anybody whenever I'm working with them. With the uh, I, 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 absolutely. Maybe Amadogs. it should be outstanding contribution. Most popular thing in the bloody but, room. But, yeah, exactly. But I'm I'm not on the judging panel. I I, I refuse to because I... I, I hate that thing of saying why didn't you vote for me so i've i've <laughs> took the position of consulting what is it <laughs> consulting contributor the most pretentious um, title i could find just so that i could have my say but not be blamed when you know certain people or animals you know do you get much of that i'm sure you don't get too much of that though what abuse Constantly. Well, I'm sure you personally yes. might get some abuse, but you're a hard guy to get on with. I mean, like in terms of people wishing that, you know, they'd got the awards or who was most deserving or any of that sort of rubbish. Generally, people do the magnanimous thing. It's, a, it's an absolute honour to be invited. Good. And then a couple of drinks later going, yeah, but why didn't you? <laughs> it's the me? British and way. I say, obviously, I, I, I did. I did. I believe in you. Um, but no, it is. And lots I, of stuff out there yeah. because even in the innovation side of it, I was looking um, there. I would. I looked at one, and it's, maybe I'm like going to call you out here because there, w- there was one in there around the zero emission based pumping appliance for, for LFB. Haven't loads of brigades yes. done that now, or have they? Or have they led on it in some way? Because they surely have just got that for obviously from a manufacturer. Or is it the case that they've invested in it first? And we'll talk about a few different ones, but I wanted to ask you about that one because it's in there against one of my favourites. I'll be honest, Steve Sadler. 
Uh, it's coming on the podcast in the next week. And I know just on call and retained or whatever people want to call it is a massive, it's the it's the million dollar question across all other services now. And I know he's doing something important, but I saw it in there against the zero emission stuff. I think it's the work that they've done to pioneer it um, okay. with uh, the, the manufacturers alongside the manufacturers. I'd, I'd, I'd have to scroll through and, and get the actual uh, nomination out to go into more detail mm. but they're all they're all worthy uh, they're all worthy considerations and it's not just the topic it's 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 around what what um uh, how is this pioneering quite a lot of the time it's mm. not just uh, brigades replicate what other brigades are doing but how is this going to make a difference and i think part of the contribution there from memory was talking about this this could facil- this could be the trailblazer to ensure that um, we go zero uh, carbon Somebody's got to go first, haven't they? For more That's services the big thing yeah, of all of absolutely. this. So London Fire Brigade being the biggest and theoretically you know, the best funded and all that sort of jazz, someone's got to step forward and go, okay, we're all talking about this. We're actually going to do it. Otherwise, it's not going to get done. Because it is expensive. I mean, I remember when we went to um, one of the services shows last year, I think the difference between a standard appliance, standard appliance like 370 uh thousand pounds or something like that you can get some for about 320 depending on type of appliances and then your electric vehicles were like seven or eight hundred they're at least two or three times the cost and i was like wow you know the government's gonna have to support or subsidize or or do something with it so i do look forward to learning a little bit more we need to do a full episode with some expert on that at some point because it's something that's race into the forefront of everybody's mind especially when we're talking about you know 2030 or whatever it is we're not going to be selling um, diesel and petrol cars and all that sort of stuff anymore. The emergency services and the government in general really do need to practice what we preach. So we're going to have to lead the way. And we've got some okay. huge fleets of vehicles. So um, it's good to see them going going first, I suppose. In the collaboration stuff, I was interested to see some of the Ukraine things yeah. in there. Because again, that's not necessarily um, the first time anybody's ever done these things because um, you know, organizations like Fire Aid, which is the NFCC stuff, and then there's a, yeah, there's a couple of ones. There's a Scotland one whose name is Sarah, isn't it? And there's a couple of other organizations that have done a lot of great stuff out there this year. Today's episode was brought to you by our good friends at Williamwood Watches. We put so much thought into the people that we partner with on the podcast, and Williamwood Watches has been with us since the beginning. Now they have six different collections now. In October, they brought out their new Fearless collection. Now, I've been speaking to some people in the past who have got that William Wood watch for a specific occasion for something really smart, really classy. But the best thing about the Phyllis collection is that it's built to be worn in active surroundings. Now, again, if you're unfamiliar with it, the massive core of all these William Wood watches is the upcycling of firefighting materials. And the Phyllis collection has got a 100-year-old British brass firefighter helmet melted down and placed inside the crown of the watch. That's exactly the same as they have with all of their collections. But this one also features repurposed black fire hose. I myself went for the Valiant watch. I've had this for a couple of years now. Really nice i've got it in the red strap there's a whole range of payment options go over and take a look at them whether you're thinking of a retirement gift you've got something special to celebrate or you have just started your emergency services career go over and check them out williamwoodwatches.com the best way to support the podcast is to support our sponsors so please take a click in the notes below now back to the show yeah i mean the the collaborations are exceptional that you mentioned fire aid that um that's with it's almost like the the whole uk fire sector coming together mm, yeah. um, with fire aid the national fire chiefs council fire industry association fire suppliers fire and rescue services if there's anybody who hasn't contributed to the ukraine convoys uh, in the uk fire sector i've yet to meet them you know it's, it's a phenomenal coming together <laughs> that's why i think um, it's unfair the, to be against them in that sector because the, <laughs> there's like the, so many people involved in that project well, I'd, I'd be annoyed if i was up against that one well they held a function parliamentary fundraising function the other week which i was uh, honored to be invited to although it cost me a fortune um <laughs> <laughs> it, it was uh, with uh, the fire aid were hosting that um and it, they did detail how that came together and it was, it was just you know sort of key figures that managed to to draw that together through nfc the, the three sort of main protagonists were fire aid nfcc and uh, fire industry association so and the key, key figures there that managed to do that um claire hoyland from fire aid uh, sarah adamson from oh, no, fia that's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, um, I know Sarah as uh, well. Sarah Adamson, she's done a lot of work with... It's Angloco. Angloco, but, yeah. But yeah. Sarah's really cool, actually. I love Sarah. Getting that together is immense. But there was a, another one, uh, a little a little known one. Uh, the training college in Malta um, mm. was asked to do some training by a US NGO. 
um, of Syrian firefighters who were facing um, wildfires and didn't have their requisite training. And this was during sort of the aftermath of COVID and lockdown and such like. So they managed to get together and do online training for advanced firefighting. Um, and that involved translators from four different countries, uh, an immense international operation to deliver what we're doing now, which is basically having a chat online mm. um, with some obviously high class training involved. And it's things like that where you go, it, it's little known, little understood, but there's some immense, immense work going on and complicated work. Um, that doesn't always get the uh, the headlines and the recognition it deserves. So there's things like that going on, as well as the the, the I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say run of the mill, but it's almost standard now the the amount of um, fire safety community activity that goes on oh, yeah. that's above and beyond. You know the the interaction with communities. Um, Hertfordshire doing um, the family support scheme. Uh, I've been helping out there. Um, so there's all sorts, and uh, it, it never stops. And the the five services charitable commitments i know through the firefighters charity um is immense and they've just opened up that new um that new center haven't they because you've you, you just you've just done a feature on it this week they've opened up a new family center in devon is it yes it's the center with it. it's the sort of freeze cottage i think it's called within yeah. uh a that's House. amazing um, i love that that's the fa- stuff like that. great. family orientated yeah we would we were sort of going in that direction when we repurposed uh reopened harkham in 2019 i think it was as then duke of cambridge opened that um and that was the the sort of start of in many ways the the full-on commitment towards the family um, of 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 firefighters rather than just the individuals really coming a lot of that came out of grenfell um and the the wider impact so they're our partner of choice uh, as, as they have been from the start because i'm slightly biased but um, that doesn't mean to say that all the other charities that do doing immense work um around the world fire aid being a, a trailblazer in that regard um we'd also get our support hey folks just wanted to jump in with a quick piece around firefighter health and well-being whether you are trying to join the fire service and pass them tricky fitness tests if you are currently serving or if you are coming up to that next chapter of your life retiring from the emergency services We get so many different questions around it. So in partnership with Fitness for the Frontline, we have come up with a series of guidance and programs specifically designed to reflect the physical elements of the role of a firefighter. So whether it's carrying an LPP across an overgrown field, lifting a ladder above your head under running it, or wrestling with cutting gear for 30 plus minutes at some kind of complicated RTC, our bodies are required to lift, push, and carry objects in very specific circumstances. That is effectively what Fitness on the Frontline focuses on, as well as the longer term aspects of overall health and wellness for our firefighters. Now, we are definitely not about to be smashing out world records or getting that beach body ready in six weeks rubbish. The systems and programs that we put in place are adjusted for people's current fitness levels and they're not a prescriptive weight or a one size fits all BS. It is very likely for myself personally that I'm still going to be a firefighter when I'm 60 plus. So longevity in the role is really important to me and I know it is for so many people out there. It all starts with no obligation, seven days worth of the programming, absolutely free. So whether you're joining, serving, or looking at the next chapter in your life, Fitness for the Frontline is designed by firefighters for firefighters. Now back to the show. I wanted to ask you about some of the big things you've been covering in the sector, even just over the past few weeks, because you, you've said about how many awards are coming through and how it's like, it's literally a non slop onslaught of people going above and beyond. But we have also seen some immense challenges um, over the past few weeks, both around um, the Independent Culture Review. We just released an episode about it uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago for, for London Fire Brigade. Um, there's some good pieces in there around supporting people in their development as well and how that whole sort of like leadership development and picking the right people, which kind of leads me on to the whole practice to progress thing. So firstly, I wanted to kind of get your input on how you saw maybe the, the culture of you um, has come out, the thoughts about it. I know Fire Magazine, people can go over and have a look. You guys have, have done a piece on it already uh, and obviously spoke to the commissioner. But it was it was a tough read, to be honest. Yeah, I was rereading it uh, just before we came on. Um, it's interesting because uh, Nazir Afsal, the author, um, was speaking at the Asian Fire Services Association conference last week, okay. um, last Thursday, and it, and the report was leaked on the Saturday, um, and he was expecting it to come out on the Monday, as, as was everybody else, mm. and didn't reference it, really was very strict uh, on himself um, in being very, very uh, 
uh, professional discreet uh, and didn't reference that but he told his his story his background it's absolutely fascinating and the listening aspect was actually the the kind of crescendo of that um, because as northwest uh, crown prosecutor chief prosecutor he went after the rochdale grooming gangs uh, and oh, was wow. the one that that prosecuted those was the one that that uh, that you know from that vast amount of evidence from um, young girls that had been through the childcare system and were unsupported and unlistened to and abused. Um, and that precipitated uh, an onslaught from him personally. I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing his personal story here. I feel a bit, I No, 100%. That, but, well, but I'm going to badger him now. Refi- he sounds like a fascinating it, individual. I'm going to try and get him as a guest. <laughs> yeah, oh, he is. He is. And, and very, very funny, very, obviously very uh, perceptive. But it, that precipitated um, the onslaught of. Uh, to prosecute uh, outstanding sexual abuse cases, the likes of Rolf, Rolf Harris and Stuart Hall. Um, but the the kind of the, the real key to come from that was was one um, lady who it didn't manage to secure the prosecution for, but it, it, there were several others um, that the individual was sent down for. Um, and he was apologetic to her. But she came back and said, you listened, you understood, you, you know, that that gave me closure. Um, and I think that's an, an incredible thing. And I think that approach is what he's done within London Fire Brigade, which is to listen, uh, to give voice to people who were previously marginalised um, and uh, suffered extreme uh, uh, abuse, which is obviously shocking and completely unacceptable and is uh, is uh, as the commissioner has said, they're, they're working on uh, dealing with that. And the first step was to do an open, independent review uh, and open themselves up to that. But that's what's needed to shine a light on the shocking uh, revelations that have come out, yeah. uh, which I hope um, and would like to believe doesn't exist more broadly within the UK Fire and Rescue Services. But I'm sure there are pockets of that because of. of of uh, antiquated cultural systems that the HMI have pointed to. Um, mm. There's still a lot of work to be done, but there are also, and it's this is what the awards come back to. And if you look at the outstanding contributions and the the team support and and, and various other awards uh, uh, categories, that are recognising the incredible work that um, EDI leads and departments are doing to really transform communities uh, both internally and externally. And, and that's quite remarkable. So mm-hmm. there's, there's, it's, it's worth, yes, it's worth, it's worth flagging these things up, but it's also worth saying that um, there are things being done, which is a long-winded way of coming back mm-hmm. to practice to progress, which we developed in conjunction with the police practice to progress um, back uh, a few years ago. Um, and we adapted to the fire and rescue service. And by adapting, um, we didn't do a commercial model. We worked with the Asian Fire Service Association in partnership and women in the fire service um, to provide a bank 70 assessors that come from a, a, a huge, diverse range of backgrounds to provide support and mentors, mentoring and coaching and assessing to help everybody within the, the service um, be able to progress and the one thing one thing that Nasir did let slip he said that uh, about the report he said that well, there was one BME individual that didn't get promoted and he was the only one among his cadre of, of people of candidates that went into it um, that didn't have coaching and mentoring support absolutely none and all of his white colleagues did mm. now practice to progress says if you want to target BME individuals, you can do this. If you want to target everybody, give everybody the same opportunity to progress, then surely an independent resource such as this, which is not for profit, it's a cost recovery model, and it will provide people who have been through that experience. Because one of the issues is BME individuals are not allowed to fail. And as you kept saying this, it's one strike and you're out. That's been the cultural conditioning almost across society. Whereas Samantha Samuels, a very a group commander at West Midlands, spoke, spoke at a Black History Month conference the other month and said, I put it on Instagram when I got promoted and everyone, yay, but eight times I'd failed, eight times. 
And people don't get to hear about that. Failing is okay. Failing is part of the process. And we should make sure that the support is in place so people are allowed to learn from that. And assessors that have been through that have got that background from AFSA, from the likes of women in the fire service, Alex Johnson, the former chief of South Yorkshire, Becky Bryan, who's done so much in leadership within the National Fire Chiefs Council. These are our assessors and these are the people, not little or white middle-aged me talking about it. It's going to be people with the same background to help people that have failed. Alex talks about failing. She she used to have no confidence and yet she's Mm. risen through. She's got to the top. She's retired and she's still giving giving back. So that that to me is a practical, absolutely essential support mechanism that we've come in to introduce because of our ethos of sharing knowledge. That's the Fire Magazine background. That's the, the company background. But it seemed a perfect fit to get something that was working within the police. 78% success rate of black male officers succeeded in, in uh, getting promotion. So we've got something that tangibly works. And it's, and it's works for everybody. It's for on-call. It's for whole time. It's for retained. It's for everybody of all backgrounds. And that to me is about, as, as my colleague Dave Etheridge puts it, it's about widening the gate, not lowering the bar. Um, and that give me a tool. is a great statement. It is. It's brilliant. And, <laughs> and Dave, if you get to speak to Dave, he'll, he'll come out with a lot more articulate about this than I, I can. But it supports everything that the National Fire Chiefs Council are doing. So the leadership framework, there's a work uh, a workbook that each each uh, each person does along with the assessor and it fits in it aligns to uh, the code of ethics it aligns to fire standards it, it increases knowledge of what's going on and supports all of that so it's not working as as some sort of independent concept it's working to support what is already in place the values and ethics of each organization and it's done so completely confidentially um, and uh, to do so in, in a, a, a supportive environment. So I think it's magic. Um, if I had that during my career or the equivalent thereof, then I would have been um, uh, absolutely delighted with it. I think it's something we 100% need now, probably more so than ever. Now we're seeing so much, uh, as I, I say, ad nauseum on the podcast, we're seeing so much retirement. We're seeing so many people move quick and fast and slick through the through the ranks. Are they getting the full breadth of personal development as they move through probably not at the moment not through their own fault as such it's a bit like you know we need to we need to fill these positions and these individuals are the best of what we have available but it's almost like we're um we're missing that lateral development at times so i think this when you speak you know passionately about that mentor and in that coaching aspect of it those are the bits that probably help people gain a little bit more understanding of themselves a little bit more self-awareness um, which 100% is, you know, it's been proven that it will it will give people that greater leadership ability as they're moving into these positions. Because otherwise, you know, it's it's easier to promote people and it's harder to to sort of roll that back if you feel like you've made a mistake. So it's good to see something like this coming in now, I suppose, at least. It's absolutely essential at that same Black History Month event. Um, Wayne Brown, the Deputy Chief of West Midlands, remarked that when he goes to events. He's the only person of colour in the room quite frequently at a senior level. And why is it, he questioned, why is it that the senior management of all fire and rescue services, that they tend to recruit from within? Why is that? And why is it that they're mainly white um, men that are recruited into those roles when there are half a dozen at least BME people within each organisation, with each fire and rescue service, with the potential to progress? Um, and another speaker at that event, Lou Taylor, who's the Southern lead for uh, Black History Month, said he talked about in, um, institu- institutional exclusion and with the, the forward invisible institutional exclusion. And with a, with a workforce that is 95% white and male, um, then it, you can see it in the UK Fire Service. In order to change that, you have to go out and make it do positive action and you have to intervene to make a difference otherwise it's just me and you staring at each other Pete looking (laughs) like you know each other it's like looking in the mirror I mean people can imagine this good looking blokes but um, (laughs) do you think we're now seeing the fruits of that labor though because I look at this in the same way that when I've had conversations with women in the fire service it may have felt like 
and I'm kind of going to repeat a point here, but it may have felt like over the last 15 years, we saw, we saw little to no progress. But I think the, the hidden factor there was that we simply didn't have as many people leaving. The turnover of staff wasn't as high. Now we are coming to that natural point of retirement. I think we're going to start seeing that now anyway. So I almost don't want to, con I don't want to continue to over index on these aspects because I don't think we're doing it wrong. I think what we have been doing for the last five years, at least, probably not before that, but we are on the right track. So just because we're not quite seeing it now, as we continue to do recruitment, as we continue to see people climb the ranks, I think we should continue on the same path. But I feel like we're actually in a good place. We might not see that reflected in the figures at the higher echelons of organizations, but that will come with time. Do you know what I mean? The only way you're going to fix that right here right now is if you go and sack people simply to replace them with people of of, of different origins, unlike yeah. the standard no. white male. So I do think we are going to see that. But it's not a simple like that. The return on that investment is a long, it's a long path. And I think we're now at a point where we're going to start seeing that really quickly over the next like three or it, four years. I'd like to think so, but I, I would say that you've got to do something. You've got to make a practical difference. I said that at a conference a few years ago with an, with AFSA um, that we put on called Changing the Face of the UK Fire and Rescue Service. Didn't really work. Um, and I said, uh, white men of influence and in positions of influence such as myself, I've got to say something meaningful and do something impactful, which sounded like sounded like a jolly soundbite. But actually, the impactful, so doing something impactful is very difficult. What we try to do in the magazine is make uh, make it visible that, that people of color could progress. And let's 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 uh, see these people in various roles within the fire and rescue service and we ran several things doing that but ultimately you look back 20 years ago and there were six principal officers from bme background now there are two in the uk mm. fire and rescue service didn't know that so when nazir <laughs> aslaf at the conference last week said how many chief officers are people of color None. How many chief constables have, have there been? There was one about 10 years ago. How many chief executives of the top 50 NHS trusts are BME? I think there's one. When 25% of the workforce is. So something practical has to be done. Leaders need to intervene to make sure that something's done. I'm going to talk about positive action. I don't mean to, to, to discriminate against anybody from any background. It's just make sure that those people without the confidence that haven't had the confidence, haven't had the even breaks, haven't had the level playing field are empowered to move on. I think that's the empowerment bit is that we're aut automatically empowered. I've, I'm automatically empowered. You mm. are. We've, 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 we've schmoozed our way through life. It's easy. Um, mm. But we just need to work together and do something. So I'm, I'm, I can talk a great fight. Um, and do so in the magazine, but it's about implementing things such as practice to progress and being practically of use um, and intervening. I think that's really important because how else are you going to wield your influence as, as you know, and I'm speaking to, to people of influence out there, what are you actually going to do? Are you, are you going to talk? Are you going to quote the code of ethics? Are you going to quote the fire standards? Are you going to, you know, reference doctrine and, and such like? Or what do you actually do? How do you intervene? How do you make a difference? I wanted to move us on to something that has probably gone quiet in the last few weeks or maybe the last month. But certainly when we saw the declaration from the World Health Organization with regard to firefighting being a, a cancerous profession and the decontamination efforts that have been ongoing for a very very long time and you ran an article earlier in uh, october around we're one year on now from from decon and some of the stuff that the fire brigade union have been working on and they 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 put this as the beginning of the decon generation do you think that do you think that's the case do you think we are where we need to be or do you just think simply we've raised awareness do you think we've got the tools out there at the minute to really make a difference and protect firefighters um given how we've so heavily invested in some elements of ppe that have now been proven not to do what they say on the tin unfortunately i fully applaud i was at the fbu conference um oh, was it is it earlier this year crikey um time does fly mm. um and and their decon session was the best session i've ever been to um and i've been going to 
conferences uh, for based on 25 years or how, however many years um, for the, the the absolutely loaded um, emotion there of people talking about um, their sufferance, colleagues, losing colleagues, losing loved ones, losing, losing family members. Uh, and I think we're all in that environment of knowing and uh, friends uh, that have passed away that were very possibly um, long before their time and, and were due to uh, contamination. Uh, the raising awareness is the first step. Um, and I think I fully support uh, the FBU's initiative in doing that. Um, and we've done so in the magazine and featured their, um, their research findings and encouraged further research. Um, the working with suppliers and technology and industry to ensure that safe handling of materials, that safe washing of PPE, all of these things are absolutely central to what our awards are about. You know, we, we set up as an industry and fire and rescue service convergence. It's not a separation. Um, and quite often industry is on the outside looking in saying, we've got this great idea about um, zero emissions vehicle and how we can change your infrastructure and how we can help you do that because we've done that over here or we've done that in the military or we've done that wherever. The fire and rescue service tends to be very um, focused inward quite often when it comes to technology and innovation. And I think people- We are pretty siloed that. like that. I think we forget how many, how much correlating information, research, innovation there is outside of our sector. I don't know why that is. And I've had that it's, feedback from, from like manufacturers and providers as well. And they often say, you know, the fire service is a very, very funny place. And I think it came from, and I won't mention who, but it came from one manufacturer where they said around, you know, when we present all of this data and stuff, it's like you have to go through the process every single time with each chief of each service, because by comparison to working with large police forces or large military forces or NHS, certainly as a you know, as an absolute behemoth of an organization, each fire and rescue services and or brigade acts like its own little empire. And, and that can it can be, make people very proud, which is great. And we want to see that. But it can also subconsciously force that siloed working where we don't speak to each other very much and uh, it's astonishing when i hear some things that are going on in other services and i'm like how do we not all know about that i think you, you've articulated the problem perfectly and that's why fire ESA, now called fres fire rescue i can't remember the acronym now so it's so recent uh through the fire industry association um has has challenged on these issues and keeps keeps trying to raise the bar and in, in in terms of collaboration um but things i don't think have fundamentally changed i think there's still a very narrow aspect to innovation collaboration and embracing new technology it needs to be thrown wide open um, and that interaction between industry and fire and rescue services needs to be on a, a level of playing field i think it needs to be that you know you're, you're the innovators you know industry are the innovators mm. they work in different sectors they work globally yeah. um, they've they've done immense amazing things um, and yet the fire service can be very insular very prescriptive and still working in silos when it comes to to recognizing the problem they talk about problems rather than solutions i think too often yes. um, whereas we should be solution driven um, and we should be able to, we should be talking about um, improving services to, to embracing technology in such a way that firefighting technology is moving forward leaps and bounds. But what we tend to do is look at what Scandinavia are doing or look, look elsewhere and adapt technology that can often be 20 years old because it's taken that long to go through the scrutiny and appraisal and the research and all the rest of it. Um, it's not particularly innovative. That, once again, is, is uh, I, I challenge that myself by saying that, yeah, there are pockets where it does work. Um, and and you, you, raise, uh, you raised a couple earlier in the innovation uh, mm. category. Um, there, is, there is all sorts of innovative uh, initiatives underway that challenge that thinking. And that's the way it should be. Um, but I think we need to, as a, as a whole sector, come together and, and acknowledge the, the bigger picture, which is we should be doing better at this. 
Mm. You know, it's a bit like culture change. If you've got a culture review, the HMI State of Fire report was saying a few years ago, you know, the fire and rescue service needs to up its game. So what have we done collective? Well, there's, there's the leadership framework from NFCC, there's bits and bats, but there's a, there's a kind of collectivism that would be more helpful. And this is what the awards represent to me, is that coming together. So yeah. we're not we're not working in silo, and and for an industry awards, look at look at the amount of individual EDI um, related categories where we're talking about LGBTQ plus. We're talking about most influential women in fire. In an ideal world, we wouldn't have separate categories because there'd be a level playing field, but there isn't. So we do we put we we put these people um, we we mark them out because it, it's necessary to identify best practice. Mm. Um, but identifying best practice starts, you know, with with the innovation, collaboration, emergency services, collaboration, training provider, projects, teams, all these different categories are, are, are really about highlighting what's working out there. And a, a, a friend of mine said, oh yeah, I'm in the house, uh, housing category and we have our industry awards and there's industry awards all over the place and each department gets their little tick of, you know, a badge of honor and they've yeah. gone been nominated this year. And I, and they said, is, is that what yours is like? And I said, you should come along because it, it really isn't. It's not that at all. These, you know, this is the, the, from the feedback I've got from winners in the past and nominees is that this has really made a difference. This is, this marks us out. This is, this is something that we're getting acknowledged for, including uh, a winner that had said to me, that she was so inspired by the win that she's now going to move on and progress. This is a few years ago and carry on her career because she's stagnated. Um, but the award served to inspire to say that this is this is what I should be doing more of. Mm. Um, the very things that the nominee listing, the very things that I have been have won this award for, I will actually um, I will grow and. and and, you know and, and move on with those so I, that's what it means that's what i think it means um to come come to, uh, to come well, i think by comparison a lot of services are are very small in the grand scheme of things and i'll say that as an offensive way but what i'm trying to say there is yeah. these individuals when they get scattered back to the wind and they return back to their home services they may very well realistically be working in a department maybe by themselves or just them and two other people and everyone's work is essential and everyone's work is important but they perhaps can feel quite lonely and don't have that connection with these other services despite the fact that the work they're doing truly is incredible and it's not inherently that their service doesn't care about what they're doing but everybody is so busy just to trying to keep the hamster wheel turning so it's only when we get an opportunity for things like the awards and it is really good of a lot of chief officers and so on and so forth who who put these nominations in to give that opportunity for those individuals to be truly acknowledged otherwise you only have to be they always say what what gets recognized and rewarded gets repeated so you only have to be ignored for so long um before you go you know what what's the point or you know like that woman said you know about the aspects of stagnating and not seeing the value in what they're doing but when you can pull your head up out of the sand pit even just f for one day and connect with other people that say oh yeah, I've been following the work that you've been doing or I've been seeing it on your service matters or I saw it in the magazine and I've seen the project path and I've seen the arc that's taken and I've seen the results that you've got from it. What can we learn about it? You know, can we put together a call? Can you help us perhaps implement something similar? And that is a massive injection of, of recognition and, and, and motivation ultimately for people as corny as that might sound. That's how I certainly yeah. see it. I get quite romantic about stuff like that because I, I, I'm big on acknowledgement. I really enjoy It's kind of the whole point of the podcast really. It's, it's speaking to those people and acknowledging people that probably will do 30 years retire and the things will get forgotten otherwise. It's almost like a timestamp to, to recognize them. And I see the awards in the very same yeah. way. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's what we do, basically what I do for a living through the magazine. It's about recognition. <laughs> yeah. it's, about, it's about highlighting um, whether that's best practice, or sharing knowledge, sharing understanding, sharing insight, sharing the, the way to do things, getting frustrated when things don't work, campaigning. Um, it's, it's, that's what it's all about. Um, and not everybody gets the opportunity to do that, as you say, in their day job, because it's so difficult. And it's, and it's also hard to get acknowledged you know there might be mm. internal some some recognition but it's 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 difficult often and the extra work that people put in is, is quite phenomenal um going out into the community and doing 
uh, put in, in hours and hours is just quite incredible and, and the amount of work that goes on I mean there's, there's, there's initiatives all over the place and you know the magazine features them all the time which I, I, yeah I think it's a great honor to be able to uh, to pay tribute to that I did want to ask you if I could I know you're only an impartial observer but it is something that is probably going to f- not flood but it's going to play a poignant part in the magazine over the coming months for better or worse, I mean, for me, I want to, I was about to say unfortunately, but actually I don't mean unfortunately, but also kind of do. I'll get to the point. You featured an article uh, a week or so ago around the ballot dates announced. So UK Fire and Rescue Service, um, we did an episode around pay and the undulating increases that it's had and the pay gap that went on for a number of years. And now we're at that horrible point again yeah. where we are quite potentially looking at uh, industrial action. Uh, the firefighter strike ballot goes out when does it go out it goes out on the 5th of december so in a december, few days yeah. time yeah and it, but it's open for a whole month so hopefully the well, well i'm pretty confident there'll obviously be no strike action during christmas and new year's because i think that was what's so hard for me and the point i also want to ask you is around like a lot of people now because we've seen so much recruitment in the past five years won't remember what it was like last time because it's been a long time was it been 10 years yeah 2014 Probably. or something 2014. Like that, yeah. eight yeah. years eight nine years yeah. since we had any industrial action before It was bloody horrible from my personal opinion Um, and I don't want, I would hate to see those types of things um, destroy all the good work that's getting done. You know, people throwing down their tools, throwing up their arms, going, I'm not playing anymore, I'm taking my ball home and I'm not, I'm not being part of this and, and, and seeing the sector grind to a halt is what I don't want to see. So for people that perhaps don't remember, you know, what's your reflections on the last time things like this happened? And, and is there any kind of fears about it? I'm not inherently asking for your opinion because I know you're, you're external to the whole yeah. thing, but how do you see it? Because it is something you're probably going to do some coverage on. I know you, you support the communication of it all. Yeah, the, the difficult, I mean, obviously I, I've got the same foreboding that you have and it's, it's I don't want to get drawn oh, it's into, horrible. It's uh, horrible. yeah, yeah, into, so, and I'm an independent observer. I'm not, I'm not, so involved intrinsically yeah. with fire and rescue service day to day but to me i mean last time was was the biggest memory was the, it was flashbacks to the time before um which is now 20 years ago mm. um and we were more involved back then we were it was um it was slightly different and i i was involved in a lot of media you know the media coverage and commentating on situations and trying to be impartial but also supportive and and what have you um and that didn't do a job good obviously um because Mm. i think i was naive and thought that well this will help um how does how does discussing it with the then c4 president jeff ord on tv help anything other than we're saying yeah we're largely in agreement yeah we should get something they should get something blah 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 um (laughs) so uh, made the obvious uh, decision last time to to step back yeah and be supportive wherever possible what it does to fire and rescue services it's 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 that other you know it's another change bomb that's thrown into the mix you know it's you've got the pandemic you've got cost of living crisis you've got all sorts of you know constant stream of large impediments and this is possibly the largest um that's coming up how do fire and rescue services navigate the, the, the way through them? I suggest that the ones that are in a good position now will co- cope, um, and, and that goes back to HMI and how they're doing with their cultural uh, yeah. programs, how, the, how they are, um, that they will be able to manage that, um, hopefully, much, you know, with, with a, to minimise the impact. But, you know, when you're talking about public service uh safety and public safety and firefighter safety um these are all you know alarm bells that are deeply disturbing for the service that's what worries and for me. everybody involved. and i'm not going to ask you to give comment on this bit but i'll just say for my own opinion but that's what worries me about places like lfb because i've got a number of men and women that work there that i love i mean head of hills love they specifically mm. moved to lfb because they wanted to be tip of the sword they wanted to be the biggest or whatever the most well-funded and they really wanted to go there and make a difference and i feel like you know, we've now gone to ballot action. So like kind of one of the wheels has fell off and the, the culture's a bit rickety. Then they've had the gut punch of this review and it's like, God, I'm worry. I worry greatly for it. And I'm not going to ask you to pass comments so we can simply move past it. Well, if you I, want I, to, but I, I will, really do I will, worry about it. 
I will pass one comment because uh, rereading the report today um, is what they did was highlight where it does work, you know, where, where the system yeah. um, and the, the fellowship, there's this mutual support um, is, is absolutely immense. And the, when it, and there are pockets um, that did the, you know, the disappointment is that it, it's random. Well, that's the economy of scale thing. I think like it's a, it's like the the it's like ten services. It, people almost say yeah. that it's unmanageable. It's so big that it's unmanageable. You know, it's like when you say, "Oh, I know someone that works in LFB. You work in LFB. You must know them." No, they've got no idea. They don't know each other. You know, there's there's so many people that's... there. Is it is it truly manageable? Because I love what you say there, and you're absolutely right. That's why we did an episode on it. Because if people actually get past the comments in the media and go into it, there are a number of wonderful examples of watches of you know, women, black, white, all different sorts of diversities that have had great support, recruits that have had wonderful development journeys, but they're not the ones that necessarily make the headlines is the only challenge. And that's what really has been a, an emotional trigger for people, I think. Absolutely. And I think that those comments have been increasingly vocal about the size and scale and politicization of the brigade that, that doesn't seem to bear any semblance with other fire and rescue services in the mm. UK. Um, and there are pluses and minuses to that. Um, we're hearing obviously mostly the minuses. Um, I would like to think that because of that, there would be very, uh, it would be highly unlikely that the sort of scale of, of um, cultural issues within uh, London were reflected elsewhere. But who's to say? You know, there the needs to be more independent reviews. Uh, well, maybe I think the, the fact that places are that, smaller. So if we said there's 100 in 6,000 or whatever it is, and then we said, well, there's, uh, my brigade's got 600, so there's only one person. It, I my naivety, I find it very easy when I have had people in, on my crew or on my watch under my command um, behaving in a manner which I don't believe is fair. It's been easier for me, only personally. And again, that might be an elitist thing. I'm a confident, assertive white male, blah, 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 whatever. So maybe it's easier for me, but it's easier to stamp it out when the problem is... When I was going to say the problem is smaller, but it's not necessarily smaller if you work on percentages, but when you have those percentages, you could very easily have an entire watch, you know, six, 12 people, all of that ilk, all of that poor moral code. And that can become very toxic, very toxic, Yeah. Um, which is dangerous. Whereas, you know, if you've got one, one bad egg on a watch, you can address it and you can almost overwhelm it re-educate or if if required dismiss and deal with easier i don't and i, and I, I can't I suppose it's harsh for me to say that because i've never worked for london fire brigade but um i don't know do you am i fishing there do you think it's i think what you've said initially is that it's huge and yeah. it, 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 it sets up its own complications but it, it that's not a get out clause Everybody that i've spoken to about it both within the fire and rescue service people like yourself within industry, uh, equally from all different backgrounds, are equally shocked saying, how does this happen in this day and age? How does that not get reported? How does that not get acted upon? I think that was the shock of probably the the, the uh, report writers themselves, is that mm. this is just unbelievable. It almost feels um, so extreme to the point where people think that's got to be a lie. But then again, maybe it echoes back to the practice to progress thing, because I think some of the leadership development, and I'm not going to alienate it to LFB, but it's been like, and it says it in the report, there are so many managers that just hate and avoid uncomfortable conversations. Yes. And that is you're accepting, you're tolerating something. They say whatever you permit, you promote, isn't it? And if you can stand by while those things take place, you're not, yeah. you know, you don't, you're not a manager for the 364 days a year where you don't have to have an uncomfortable conversation. It's usually that one uncomfortable conversation where you demonstrate your moral compass that truly demonstrates your leadership ability, I think. Yeah, and leadership is just, uh, excuse me, the work that NFCC are doing and the leadership framework is that you've, you've got these moral principles, but um, but actually you, you put your finger on it, invoking it, doing the doing the job requires... There are grey areas and it requires fortitude and it requires other elements of substance um, that also need to be kind of delved into. What are the skills? What are the... It's like an art form, I always say, because it's very personal. Me, as a six foot five, 18 stone male, I will have to have different soft skills and a different way that I build rapport with people, the different way I deal with people than will a 
five foot whatever um, woman of, of African origin or whatever it might be, she will have a different skill set. Um, because if I am overly assertive, then I might come across as bullying or intimidating. So that's why I feel like it's not like standard, you know, operating procedures or national operational guidance or anything like that. You can't yeah. just, you know, we all approach a fire in the same way. Okay, but we don't all lead teams in the same way. I always say to people, treat everybody equally, but don't treat them the same because they're not all the same and I'm not the same as a leader. So that's where, as you said about this coaching and mentoring aspect, I think that's why those types of things that you speak about in practice to progress are so very important because coaching and mentoring is all about that individual's personal development areas and how they, as a leader, build rapport and get their, get their values across because it's not going to be the same for everybody. Yeah, I agree. I wanted to just go back and, and close the loop on the um, on the ballot action and on the on the pay stuff only because when we speak about the awards and we speak about all the exemplary, incredible people that are doing some amazing things in the sector, my only fear is, and maybe it echoes as well about when we're speaking about people of these um, um, BAME backgrounds, women in the fire service, stuff like that, almost we might accidentally create a beast that we don't understand. And what I mean by that is, we encourage people to develop, we encourage them to progress, we encourage them to make a difference. If we end up with a sector that is so poorly paid and so poorly appreciated that is not desirable to talent anymore, then those individuals would leave, not because they inherently are not given opportunities or that they hate the sector, perhaps, and, and I'm open to being corrected, this is just one tangent that I'm going off on. Like, If you were developed to have high standards to expect the best to you know know that you can make a difference to be rewarded fairly economically for the work that you do but then you're part of a sector that is so poorly paid you have to have a second income and i that worries me because we'll lose all these talented people that you're going to acknowledge and that the teams and everything and the sector is going to acknowledge in the next few weeks i worry that that will stop yeah i think when you're talking about you're talking about paying conditions it's, it's a whole coterie of issues that each organization needs to set themselves up, wants to set themselves up as the employer of choice. That's that's the crucial aspect. Now, obviously, pay is, is absolutely a huge element to that, but it's part of that, can I progress within this organization? Can I make a difference? Can others, can I help inspire others to make a difference? Um, Wayne Bowcock, the chief of Royal Berkshire, was saying the other day that when he was interviewed for the job, he had a lot of staff group meetings and he asked them the question because it was essential for him if he was going to move there. He asked the staff, and I think it was various groups from various parts of the organization, would you recommend that a loved one comes and works in this organization? Would you recommend that? Mm. Um, and he became chief. So I'd like to say, I'd like to think that people did uh, respond in the positive. It's a great question to ask if you're going for promotion or you're going, within, uh, going to a different organization. Would you have other people family members working in the fire and rescue service in this organization. I've thought that with my uh, stepdaughters and granddaughters, would I let them, you know, would I recommend fire and rescue service as a career? And I go, absolutely. If they came back with a certain organization at a certain time, I would, would I qualify that? I probably would. I'd probably do a little bit of investigation, but I could, I could reel off a whole host of fire and rescue services that I'd be delighted that they would uh, go and, and join. I think it's looking on the positive side. As employers of choice, that's great opportunities for promotion, great opportunities to develop, great opportunities to get on there, um, whether as a, a firefighter. And if, you, if you're looking to progress, then read Fire Magazine, because that'll help, um, or just widen the skills base and all the rest of it. But if you want to go, if you want to shoot for the stars, why not? Um, and there are networking groups, and I keep mentioning those networking groups. That's what Nazir kept talking about as well uh, in conference: is get the network, get the support, because that offers mentoring, uh, which is really useful for, from from like-minded people who have been through experiences that can help. And w within organisations, uh, there are support networking groups to do that. Um, we've got this automatically, um, but there are there are exceptions where people with all sorts of diverse neurodiverse backgrounds that need extra support. Um, and it's about an organization being able to identify and support that and help their journey through. And in, in doing all of these things, and there's a rich other coterie of activities and interventions that can be made, that the organization itself becomes much more attractive to work for. Yeah. Um, and you want to work for a place where you want to meet these people, you want to work with these people, you want to go into the 
the community sharing, knowing that the, those aspects of the community are also representative within your organization and you feel wholly supported and able to be as the you know it's talked about authentic and be your real self within that organization um, the fire and rescue service reflects the whole of, and should reflect the whole of society so you're going to get elements within but um, recruiting in terms of morals and in terms of principles rather than just the tick box qualifications can you drive and then getting people into the organization because they can drive well you can train somebody to drive but you can't necessarily train out some of the more extreme and unacceptable behaviors um, that people are bringing in. So maybe the recruiting process should be scrutinized much greater to ensure that you're recruiting the right people in the first place. That would yes. help get yes. the right people in there. Those that are, you know, are not, are not coming along and make sure that they, they're giving every support to, to ensure that their behaviours are in line with the organisation. But recruiting in the first instance, getting the right people in there really would help. And diversity is not just a nice to have. It's about getting all those skill sets in there, getting the different ways of thinking that helps the organisation be a fun, you know, enriching place to be that's what we all want from our workplaces i'm sat in a cubby hole um staring, staring i don't believe that the, i think you take a lot of your enjoyment I, from I the fact from that home. you do get to engage with a lot of people at these types of events well, and yeah, that's what gives and, you good insights and a lot of inspiring people uh, mm. you know that's that's my wider workplace to a greater extent but then again i, I you know and because of the issues we're talking about, you do he, you do come across a lot of the issues that arise in there, but they come down to fairly basic principles. I talk about code of ethics and 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 how people morally navigate themselves. That's the kind of you know these are nice words, but your behaviours display it. It's a bit like what I was talking about before: is say something meaningful, do something impactful. It's your doing. Set. We can all talk a good fight and go into an interview and say, "Yes, I believe this, and I believe yeah, in yeah, yeah. the moral code of this organisation." Blah 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 blah. It's your behavior and how you, how do you as the leader how do you assert your moral compass how would you difficult deal with that difficult situation this is a six foot five inch 18 stone firefighter how do you have the difficult conversation have you had those difficult conversations have you had to call out bullying and harassment and inappropriate behaviors what do you think about disciplinary action should should we discipline this should you take the zero tolerance approach that london fire brigade are now taking or should have that been the case anyway anybody says something uh, inappropriate in a professional environment or a social environment how do you respond how do you mm -hmm. how do you act to that how do you do that if somebody else is there and they're a partner of that person how do you do that without absolutely humiliating that other person so these are not always black and white issues it's yeah. about proper leadership and it starts from the top but it filters down through the organization so that you walk in the door and the first question you ask isn't how much do you pay because i you know i only want to do a couple of years and find somewhere else it's <laughs> what's what's this place like to work for yeah. in what are the people like what are the opportunities what are the opportunities for me and people like me and for other people that could come in and progress um, and if if you're beginning to be have a positive response there and people are saying, yeah, it's a great place to work, then that that sort of trumps all. And, and in spite of what's coming up and in spite of the difficulties, you can still have that. You can still have that support and um, appreciation uh, to guide you through your career. That's not just an aspiration. There are organizations out there within the fire sector, the suppliers that are providing organizations and and ethical approaches um, that are doing that there, there, there's evidence out there look at the HMI reports look at the good people mm -hmm. builders. look at the outstanding ones go and speak to them you know Lancashire was in, inundated at first how do you do that how do you how do you communicate with your people to, to ensure that the, the culture is where you want it to be or progressing in the way that you want it to be so yeah sorry I got on a bit of a rant there. But no, mate, I it, absolutely love it. And it's it's kind of what echoes It's more than just the money. It's more it's, than mate, just no, the money. It echoes back to the awards. Because the awards is, what have you done? Do you know what I mean? It's not your core code of ethics. It's not what you espouse as to be the way we should do something. It's what you've actually done. 
and it's where's that opportunity to acknowledge people and the way that they've walked the walk not just talk the talk so that's what i love so much about it for people that are unfamiliar with it um you've ruined it for years now but it'll be on the 9th crikey so only eight days away so 9th of december down in london i'd be remiss if we didn't give a thanks to some of the big people that are helping it happen you've obviously got gore-tex msa safety components and who's the other one it's, uh the we've got echo yeah echo, echo sorry, is the partner yes. spon- sponsors msa gore-tex echo safety components and a whole coterie of yeah. other suppliers a whole host of award sponsors on the day yeah. So I sincerely look forward to coming down there. Hopefully I'll be able to grab a conversation with a few people, maybe catch you on the day. What does a guy have to do to host it next year? To host it? Are you... <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe well... we'll continue that conversation offline. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Beautiful. And uh, you, you did a you so pretty good time. audition there, Pete. You did, well, you did we a... can only try, mate. Just buy me a coffee and we can speak later. Roger that, or, brother. Or something stronger. <laughs> Andy, thank you so much for your time, my friend. I will Cheers, see mate. you in around eight days' time in your Sunday best. And uh, good luck to all of the nominees. I'm looking forward to it. Take care. Cheers. The Firefighters Podcast is a global podcast seeking to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operators. Through a series of wide-ranging conversations celebrating those within our sector, we seek to encourage and support this incredible group of people. It's brought to you by myself, operational firefighter, Pete Wakefield, and I speak with individuals from all walks of life who I sincerely believe can add value to or develop those who have chosen this life path. Please support your emergency services wherever you are in the world, and thank you for listening.